out of fairness, that we would go to our next speaker, Mr. Purdy. Uh, and I, I will not have to apologize by not reading, uh, introducing him. He was counsel for the House Select Committee on Assassinations. He organized much of the medical evidence in the case and personally conducted numerous interviews with witnesses to the events at Bethesda and elsewhere. His personal experience with the HSCA is of great significance as he advances what's listed here as the interesting hypothesis that there is a paucity of medical data supporting conspiracy. So please welcome Mr. Andrew Purdy. Kathleen said no hard feelings. The, uh, you know, what I've uh, learned in the uh, last 20 years, 18 years or so since we finished our work, um, makes me realize how much I've forgotten in those number of years about what we did back during the HSCA. The, as, as I see the slides that, that she's pointing out, I realize that maybe we need a different procedure in terms of uh, when somebody's gonna be given I guess that's why Mike Wallace on 60 Minutes doesn't do it, where uh, you don't tell somebody in advance what you're going to tell them about. But frankly, right at the moment, I don't even remember that reference to Robert McNamara. I mean, I don't, and she mentioned Overheiser's name. I don't even remember that name. I was talking with Mike back there. He doesn't remember it either. I would be happy in a formal written thing that you can make public that if there are specific questions about some of these things, I mean, the fact that I don't remember it is no excuse. Uh, and any references somebody may have to particular places uh, in the record where the information is contained, I'd be more than happy to go through and prepare a written statement, uh, signed or whatever, that would indicate my best answer to some of these, from my experience, seem relatively technical, at least they seem technical since I can't remember the answers off the top of my head. And that's not to say that they're not important, but to give any more of an answer on the specific points that, that she raises uh, I just don't know how I could do it uh, accurately. But that's not to say that some of the more general points that she's raised I, I shouldn't respond to and try to anticipate uh, a couple that Gary Aguilar uh, is going to raise. Uh, there was some information about staff attorneys working as adversaries that she directed as a specific question from, I think, Dr. or Mr. Canning. Uh, I'd never seen that letter before and did not work directly uh, with Dr. Canning, so I don't know specifically who he was talking about as, as being adversaries. I mean, I know that when I came to work at the committee uh, and was later working under Bob Tannenbaum, I certainly uh, not only felt there was a conspiracy, I certainly wanted to prove that there was a conspiracy. And I don't exactly remember when Bob left relative to different assignments of duties, but I certainly started my work as attorney in charge of the medical evidence with the complete expectation and certainly the hope that I'd be able to prove that there was a conspiracy in the assassination and that there was more than one shot that struck the president and that the single bullet theory is ridiculous. But much to my surprise, uh, the experts that we retained and whose work I monitored uh, did not come up with evidence to indicate, in my view, that, that there was a conspiracy and I've seen nothing to, to change that view. Some specific things that uh, Dr. Aguilar talks about, he points out some, some important things to me. I left the committee at the end of December 1978. The report was written in the months that followed that. Uh, he pointed out a reference that said that our report indicated that the Bethesda persons present at the autopsy uh, supported the, uh, or excuse me, contradicted the eyewitness accounts of the doctors at Parkland. He also sent me copies of excerpts from some of the witness interviews that Mark Flanagan and I and others conducted of the people who we were able to locate were present at or around the autopsy. And a quick reading of that testimony indicates that our report stating that everyone agreed, excuse me, everyone disagreed with the accounts from Parkland was not a correct statement. Uh, I certainly don't think that I had anything to do with the writing of that statement. I do know that I recommended that all those reports uh, be made part of the public record and had every expectation they would be made part of the public record and was surprised to find out years later that the interview reports with the people at Bethesda were part of the sealed record, which I guess were sealed for 50 years. So when Dr. Aguilar says to me that, well, doesn't it look pretty bad that the records which contradict that conclusory statement about the differences between the Bethesda and Parkland doctors looked pretty bad and looked like the committee was doing the same thing that people criticized the Warren Commission of. And I say, yes, 
I mean, it, it does look bad. It was ridiculous. I can't understand why in the world they didn't print the, uh, those interview statements in the public record, and I'm glad they came out. In fact, before the legislation passed to release those documents, I wrote a lengthy letter to Congressman Stokes and spoke to him on the telephone, urging him to support that legislation to open up all those documents, and I was pleased that he did, and the documents uh, are now available. Um, I, I think that's all I want to say for now, because I'll have the chance to respond to some of the more particular points later on and give others a chance to make their opening presentations. Thank you. Uh, and by the way, the, uh, the skull fragment will be raffled off at the dinner. <laughs> thank all of our panelists, certainly for the time and effort. This is not something you do on a couple of nights and then say, I'm going to come down here to Washington and present this. This takes an immense amount of time. I would also like to thank, on behalf of all of us, the three gentlemen from the House Select Committee who perhaps came before a slightly hostile audience. Uh, I, re I deeply respect them for their courage to come here and say, this is what we did, this is the process. Please, thank you. First, Dr. Biden, again, why do you believe there is an entry wound at the level of the cowlick? Uh, number one, I just uh, regret very much that Cyril's losing his voice. And I, <laughs> he has to write. <laughs> um, when we examined the photographs, um, some of which you, you've seen, um, I didn't show a photograph with uh, the autopsy photograph. Uh, of the back of the head with the arm holding it up. Uh, that particular photograph was very um, helpful in determining that the area in the cowlick was the abrasion collar of an entrance gunshot wound, and that the area in the external occipital protuberance that's been discussed, where there was um, uh, some uh, material present that, that Hume's thought the Humes had listed as being the entrance wound uh, wasn't an entrance wound. It had it had um, adherent brain. We compared this then to the X-rays, the lateral X-ray uh, that was taken at the time of the autopsy, which we authenticated. Incidentally, All, uh, you had a session on authentication through the good offices of Andy Purdy. We went around to about eight different physicians who had treated Dr. Uh, President Kennedy previously when he was a senator and a congressman, and we got some like eight different files of skull x-rays. He was getting x-rays because of his Addison's disease and looking at the pituitary gland. And we were able to match up of the, I think the 13, were the 13 x-rays taken? Or uh, 12 of them we were able to match with prior x-rays done years before, and we were able to identify that these were the true x-rays of President Kennedy. And when we looked at the lateral x-rays, there's the, uh, the fracture uh, of the skull right underneath the area of the uh, photograph showing the entrance, what we interpret as entrance perforation. And those were two of the important reasons that we uh, thought uh, and concluded that that was the entrance. There was no fracture corresponding to the external occipital protuberance where Dr. Uh, Humes had listed as the entrance wound, and then that he recanted, he recanted, again, after talking to Dr. Petty in, the, uh, in his uh, uh, testimony under oath, which he, again, may have been changed. Okay, another question for you, Dr. Bodden. Boswell clearly states that some occipital bone is missing. Do you accept this? He's wrong. Bo Boswell, uh, uh, there, there isn't any. There, I remember people in Parkland talked about some of the cerebellum being found uh, at the at the uh, uh, in the Parkland Hospital, it's unfortunate that physicians who may be, be super at doing brain surgery or other kinds of surgery don't have training in gunshot wounds. And what was called cerebellum was not cerebellum. The cerebellum was entirely intact. Uh, uh, can I make a quick comment on, on your comment? Also, one, uh, excuse oh, sure. one other thing: we did see the uh, photographs of the brain. The brain, having been removed, was photographed. And then lost. Uh, we have ideas with that. But the, the uh, photographs. I think we'd like the, the to hear your ideas. I think we'd like to hear your ideas on where it is. The photographs of President. Yeah, it's in the casket with President Kennedy. 
uh, it was put there, uh, in my opinion, from certain information after when when the final resting place, the final uh, burial was made when he was transferred. But uh, the brain photographs show the trajectory through the top part of the cerebellum, cerebrum, which matches up with the bullet wound being in the calic area and shows the cerebellum to be perfectly intact, which would have been injured if, if uh, Humes was correct. Okay. Uh, uh, another quick, just a quick comment on that. Uh, I asked Dr. Boswell about that and about Hume's recantation. And uh, he said that they all sat down together before they wrote the, the JAM articles or went from the interviews. And they, and they both agreed uh, and Humes agreed that they would that that the wounds were low in the skull, and he and Hume Boswell told me he says, listen, that testimony that he gave down there was suspect. He said, what's in the autopsy report is right, and you should see the the, the documents that are being released now. Boswell and Hume Boswell and Fink have been were leaned on in letters and calls. All right, now listen, Humes is coming forward to change his mind. Are you guys willing to do it? Neither Humes. I'm sorry, neither Boswell nor Fink would change his mind. Both of them were leaned on in private letters to come forward and, and, uh, and recant, and, and they didn't. And now in the Journal of American Medical Association, Humes is back on the record saying the wound is low. Yeah, but remember, uh, uh, Boswell and uh, Humes had never done a gunshot wound autopsy before, had no training in it, and Pierre Fink had never done an autopsy in a gunshot wound either, although he had reviewed uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, autopsies that were sent to him for review. But he didn't do the actual autopsies. Yeah, it's hard for me to believe that they still don't know where the occipital bone is. I mean, I think that that's a, something you would fail a first year uh, student, medical student for not knowing. I wanna, I'd like to get to as many of these questions as possible, but I think it's interesting to, to rhetorically ask why did they have three people in a room that had never done a gunshot autopsy when it's the President of the United States? What, if it was you, you'd want that. I'd just like to say uh, there are a number of these points. I'd like the chance to respond to you before we break up this, this meeting. Okay, uh, uh, third question for Dr. Bodden, and then we have one for Mr. Purdy. Uh, Dr. Bodden, in your experience as, as medical examiner and, and many autopsies or, or legal cases, can you cite examples uh, when a military jacketed bullet shattered and left as many as 30 to 40 slivers or fragments in a skull? I think one of the problems we had was that in civilian life, we don't have military ammunition. So the odd situation of President Kennedy with the Malacher Carcano and then Dr. Martin Luther King with a 30 or 6 military ammunition is very unusual in civilian life. So even though in New York City we may have 2,000 homicides a year, uh, there's something like uh, none of them are military uh, rifles, or very few are. I, in fact, called up Tom Marshall at that time, who was the medical examiner in Northern Ireland, uh, to discuss with him the nature of the wounds he was finding in, the, uh, in Northern Ireland, which were all rifle wounds. The problem is, be it Vietnam, be it uh, World War II, or be it North, uh, Northern Ireland, during wartime, autopsies aren't done to find out trajectories. And in civilian life, when you do autopsies, we don't see uh, military ammunition. So that was one of the factors we had to, to deal with. But remember one thing, in civilian life, bullets are made so they don't go through the, the person because you don't want to kill innocent people. In military ammunition, it's made by uh, Geneva Convention and all. The bullets have to go through, should go through the body to cause less damage, and you don't care if it kills the next, his friend either. You don't like his friend either. So that military ammunition are, met, are, are jacketed, very thick jacketed, high velocity to go through, the, through individuals where civilian ammunition isn't. So there is a difference there. Question, I take that as a no. But you didn't have much experience with it. No, and I think okay. Cyril, Cyril is, is said it accurately. He did uh, challenge us to uh, find a similar case in civilian life. The problem is even shooting dead grandmothers is not the same as shooting living grandmothers. Living bone has blood supply and is supple and is different than than uh, dead bone. So there's a lot of differences, and we can't right now shoot living people. Except in certain states. Sure we'd like to. Uh, question for Mr. Purdy. When you examined the windshield at the National Archives, um, was there any detectable blood stains uh, on the windshield on the driver's side? I didn't see any. Okay. Uh, question again for, uh, I think you answered this. Uh, you. you were, Dr. Bodden, you were critical in your 1989 book of the JFK autopsy doctors, um, yet when JAMA came forward uh, 1992, 
uh, you remain silent. The question is, didn't you feel you had uh, some kind of duty to the people to speak at least with respect to the expertise of the, of the doctors doing it? Maybe Cyril can answer. Cyril uh, responded. Uh, I uh, am critical not only of the autopsies of President uh, Kennedy, but also the fact that, as I said, most uh, autopsies and murder victims in, this, in the United States are done by, performed by physicians who are not qualified to do those autopsies. That's the state of, of life in, in the United States. I did contact the uh, JAMA after that, but I did not write something suitable for, public, for their publication. Okay, let, um, me, let me just add a, a, a fast PS uh, for, for this audience. You should know this. And Gary Aguilar, who uh, spent so much time in addressing this with JAMA, just to show you the, the duplicity of uh, Lundberg and what his true objectives were. His objectives were not to corroborate the Warren Commission report. His objectives were to rehabilitate the reputations of his two old military buddies, uh, Humes and Boswell. When we had the meeting in Chicago three years ago, and Lundberg was given the opportunity and the right to select uh, three or four scientific witnesses of his own to go up against uh, us. Uh, he did not contact Michael or any of the other forensic pathologists from the panel. And when he wrote uh, his articles and sent Dennis Brio around to interview people, they did not contact Michael. They stayed away even from the pathologist who had mm, corroborated the conclusions of the work mission report because Michael, as you have heard him today, has never been reluctant, nor have the others, in expressing their disdain. In fact, they, they spoke even more vehemently, perhaps, than I had, at least up until that time. I had tried to be a little bit of a gentleman. Uh, because I was, already, I was attacking the conclusions, you see. They had to do more because they felt guilty about going along with the conclusions, so they had to attack <laughs> the pathologist uh, more, more strongly than I did. But I just want you to know that that was the story behind Lundberg and JAMA. Keep that in mind. Not a, a Warren Commission defense, but a Humes Boswell defense. This is a question uh, generally for any, I think any of the panel members. Was there any evidence uh, developed at the HSCA that there was autopsy work going in order to continue to restart it after FBI agents Siebert and O'Neill left the room? Not that we're aware of. Okay. No, and I don't, I don't, I don't think, having seen what, what has been released, having seen what has been released, there is no evidence of that occurring. I want to, uh, yes, sir, Dr. Baden, I have obtained both the transcript and the tape recording of Dr. Ebersol's interview with the medical panel, and so I, I, I don't know if you felt me jump when you said that uh, they, they didn't know about the throat wound at the time of autopsy, because Dr. Bos, Dr. Ebersol told you, it's on tape. He, t he told you that they knew that there was a, a wound to the throat, that they had discussed it with Dallas in the course of the autopsy. Yeah, you, should, you should understand here, we have, we have Kellerman, Greer, and uh, Dr. Berkeley, who had been in Parkland, who had been informed and given a summary about the evidence, who then traveled with the body to Bethesda. Everyone during that period of time of the body being traveling to Bethesda is pinned to their radio where they're talking about the president's wounds including presumably the autopsy pathologist, but certainly most of the other people in the autopsy room. And yet we are somehow supposed to believe that Humes, Boswell, and Fink didn't know about that wound? Sir, I, th th this is an area that I've covered a whole lot in, in my personal research. It starts, according to Paul Peters, and this is a piece of sealed testimony that Ben Bradley Jr. buried at the Kennedy Library. Paul Peters said that the telephone calls from Bethesda began immediately, and that is a quote, that's his words, immediately after the president's body left Dallas. Immediately. Air Force One, the Air Force One audio tapes show attempts to reach, and, 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 it, and there's all kinds of discussion about Bethesda on the radio, Military District of Washington, that they already know by the time the plane takes off, they already know. I mean, 
And then you've got Ebersol, Stringer. Uh, help me think of the others. Uh, Reby, Custer, Jenkins. Well, no, no, no. no, no. Who, who referred to the calls. Who referred to telephone who calls telephone before calls. or during the autopsy. The autopsy. Gerald Custer. Gerald Custer. Gerald Custer. If I may just try. My best recollection, having not gone over everything, is in uh, speaking to Dr. Humes and in reviewing all the records uh, uh, of the autopsy, when Dr. Humes did that autopsy, he did not know that there was a bullet wound in the neck. Oh, I just, do you think he could have lied? Do you think he could have lied about that? Let me finish. Let me finish. As, you, as many of you will recall, when they found, they turned the body over and they found a bullet wound in the back. And they couldn't understand where that bullet went. Remember somebody stuck a finger in and pulled it out and said the, 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 the bullet must have turned around and come out? Remember that? that I'm not making this up. I mean, you can't make that st this stuff up. <laughs> the, 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 reason, the reason he did that is because they couldn't understand um, what happened to the bullet in the back because they didn't realize that the bullet in the neck was an exit wound. And whether everybody else in that autopsy room knew about it or not, it was Dr. Humes who was doing the autopsy. Dr. Fink was up there, but he didn't contribute to the autopsy at all. He was just observing, and Fink thought that if he did anything wrong, this is what uh, Bos uh, what Hume said, is if I did anything wrong, then Fink would have said something since he didn't say anything. I thought I was doing the right job. It wasn't until 24 or 36 hours later that that Boswell, that Humes spoke with Perry, Perry on the telephone, and found out that there was a bullet wound in the neck, and that's how he reconstructed the uh, trajectory going from the back to the neck. And that's after which he, and that's why he got the measurements wrong, because then he made up some of the measurements, he, he approximated the measurements, and then he burned his own papers, the, his own, uh, the own papers he had to destroy. But uh, I'm strongly, it was my impression then and is now, whatever telephone calls were made, that uh, Hume's, w the nature and the way he did the autopsy, and his description of how he then changed the measurements a couple, a day or two later, <laughs> after speaking to Perry, that he didn't know that there was an end exit wound in the front of the neck. Uh, and it's not so marked. It's not so marked on the uh, diagram. When he draws the autopsy diagram, it just points to a uh, tracheostomy in the front of the neck. There's no indication that there's a, uh, a bullet hole in that, in that area of tracheostomy. So that's my best uh, interpretation of the findings. Yeah. Uh, there is the other thing. Uh, the other thing is, is that uh, Robert Livingston, who the former uh, previously on the faculty of five different medical schools in the United States and uh, uh, the, the founder of the neuroscience department at UC San Diego, who was then the scientific director of the National, National Institute of Neurological Disease and Blindness, called Boz Humes, spoke to him on the phone on the day of the assassination and discussed the nature of the throat wound with him. He has testified to that under oath in the Crenshaw lawsuit. And I think it's just improbable that Berkeley, who was the president's physician, who knew about all the wounds and the tracheotomy and everything like that, would not have communicated that to Humes my own personal opinion is that Humes has lied about his ignorance of that, which has exculpated him, well, at least exonerated him from not having done the dissection he should have done to trace the track. HSCA agency file number 002071, page two, Boswell to, I'm sorry, Andy, I'm sorry, <laughs> Andy Purdy. I was able to see the uh, perimeter of the bullet wound within the incision of the tracheotomy. He, yeah, this is Boswell describing his ability to make out the yeah, wound. Yeah, he's describing it sometime later. I'm talking about the autopsy report and the way it proceeded. And one of the things that was of concern to us when we discussed the autopsy itself is if, in fact, uh, Humes knew that the bullet in the back had exited uh, through a hole in the neck, that there was a hole in the neck, he might not have done an autopsy. The reason they did the autopsy was to try to figure out what happened to the bullet that they couldn't... Uh, find on x-ray and because they didn't have an exit wound uh for the bullet in the back well i mean it, I, I, you know I, i'm i'm confused on this i'm i'm well aware of what, what you and kathy have been saying and and i i gotta tell you i'm betwixt and between let me ask you guys something isn't there a quote attributed to pierre fink who says and i knew pierre i can close my eyes and same with his purse slips and his saying there is no exit wound for this hole 
Yeah. Is it Limpier yeah. Fink yeah, yeah, that? He's referring. So, so you, how do you? you yeah, know, that's in the back. That's the back one. They're probably in the back one. Yeah. First of all, that's you have to understand. I'm about, yeah, yeah, you have to understand, uh, Michael. You're wrong about the question of they're doing the, bio, the, the autopsy. They were looking for bullet evidence, but they didn't even know about the back wound theoretically until the latter stages of the autopsy, according to their own notes. No, no, no. That's that's well. That's not well, quite right. What what happened? What happened is Fink found it. Fink did not arrive until 8:30. He was caught. Fink didn't do anything in that autopsy. Fink found, no, no, Fink did find. He came at 8.30 after being called at 8. After being called before any incisions were made, they proceeded into the autopsy. They removed the brain, the heart, and the lungs. And at 8.30, Fink arrived, and this was the stage of the autopsy. He stopped everything at that point. This is according to his own notes. This is the Blumberg Memoranda, uh, February of 1965. He stopped everything. It was at that point that he ordered additional x-rays and then according to agents Siebert and O'Neill, he turned the body over and Siebert pointed the wound to the back out to him. Yeah. I just don't want silence to mean that I, I agree with you. I, I, that isn't at all what I recall and you may be right, but that's not my opinion. Listen, obviously a number of people on this panel don't think being polite and being courteous and waiting your turn uh, is appropriate. I've indicated I would like to respond to a couple of these points, and I guess I better do the same thing that they're doing. <laughs> now, when you look at the photograph that, with, that uh, Dr. Aguilar showed of McClellan showing a wound back here, and you looked at the drawing of Paul O'Connor showing a gaping wound back here, think back to this morning's session where they showed the autopsy photograph of the back of the head. And your speaker at that point said there was a large hole of exit. A large piece of bone was blown out, presumably leaving the scalp intact. Now, Mike, I asked Mike Biden about that. Maybe he wants to comment about whether that's possible. Apparently, they were saying that that higher wound that, that Mike says was a wound of entrance was actually a wound of exit. Of course, of course, Dr. Hume said that under what the panel said was a higher wound was no defect. Not only was there not an entrance hole, there was no large gaping hole in the skull. So are we going to believe oh, you're mis you? You're misrepresenting his testimony. Are we going to, you're I, just, I wrote the quote down. You said he said under the higher wound there was no defect uh, bullet wound. I just wrote it down from your presentation. Uh, well, so let's, which let's, is, you have volume seven. Well, I'll read it to you. Go ahead. The... Uh, the, the issue has been raised by Dr. Aguilar about whether the autopsy doctors are lying about the nature of the wounds and about seeing the you know, whether the photographs and x-rays accurately portrayed them. I would submit to you that if the wound was as McClellan and O'Connor are quoted here as saying, that there was a giant hole in the back of the head here, then all three autopsy doctors, regardless of how much or how little they did, are lying when they looked at that photograph of the back of the head and there was that debate about whether the cowlick was entry or whether the low thing was entry. And I think we should put aside the question of, well, there might be mistakes. You know, under, under at least Dr. Aguilar's theory, either let's say they're lying or let's get on to some other issue. Mr. Purdy, we had a question from the audience. Were the Dallas doctors, when you took testimony from them, were they shown these aut autopsy photos? We showed them the Ida Doc sketches of the autopsy photographs, which are essentially like traces, almost exact. Uh, I'm not sure they're exact yes. traces, but in other words, they were not shown the photographs. That's correct. All okay. right. I, I, one of the implications you're making is that because they didn't di dispute the photographs that they're shown and presented as aut uh, authentic photographs, that they're that they that they're basically are endorsing their authenticity. One of the things that they already did, and we know they did that, they signed a document saying that they know the photographic inventory is complete. When they then gave testimony that it was incomplete, so we've known them that they, we already know that they've been duplicitous about this. We know that they have personally said, and they told you personally, Stringer said the photographic inventory was incomplete when I first examined it. Gary, that's a whole different magnitude than their essential big picture conclusions. They said that there were two shots from the rear that struck the president. The big picture that's what they say. That's what all three yeah. of them say. Yeah. And if you're saying right. there was a giant hole yeah. in, the, in the skull that blew out from a shot from the front, then they're lying. The big picture with, with respect to the question of they were shot from behind, is it reasonable to start an autopsy report dated November 24th, which says after he passed the building which had a man in the window with a gun shots rang out and we conclude that he was shot from behind of course it's not reasonable but you're dodging the essential question about whether they're lying about whether there was a shot from the front all right well but, but if an autopsy report starts off with the essential conclusion that there's the assassin and there's the gun what else could they conclude they what were, else could that's they, what conclude? they were told they were and told. three years later if they're shown photographs 
They're in the Hobson's Choice. Okay. You're, you're oh, on, I, li you're, I lied back then. I want to come clean right now. Can I keep, asking, can I keep my license? You said that there are two exit holes in the skull. I, this morning, speaker said there are two exit holes in the skull, one a shot from the front, one a shot from the back. The autopsy doctors say there was no such exit hole, no but, such extra but, but exit But we have forensic pathologists here who are really the best in the business who are saying that the opinions of these men can't be trusted on matters forensics, and now you're going to hold forth their forensic opinions and ask us to accept them. You're the one that's hold forth their, their forensic opinions by saying we should believe them when they say the entrance wound is, is lower. And you've also said last year and this year that we don't have to conclude that they're lying. I submit for your position, we have to conclude they're oh, lying. Oh, I can, I, I agree they're lying. And, and we I, agree no, that. Let me make that very clear. They're lying. Unfortunately, <laughs> we have to conclude. Uh, if you handed me photographic material for your questions, I will have it to give back. Um, we have to move on to the next panel. Thank you again. Uh, in the interest of time, we will uh, forego the introductions. I think uh, I've spoken up here enough that uh, you know that I'm Gary Aguilar. I'd like to start with the slide before my first slide. Uh, uh, in fact, I, uh, and I'll see if I can get the, uh, these things to work. We'll focus that. Uh, <clears throat> my uh, comments here today are uh, meant uh, in the spirit of uh, good fellowship and uh, in uh, camaraderie here. I am going to be speaking on a panel with other physicians and with uh, uh, an attorney and, of course, with Kathy Cunningham on the medical evidence here. And I think that the medical evidence is something which is important and quite interesting to me. Uh, I do not assume, uh, as an operating principle myself, that I'm dealing with people in bad faith. I assume, in fact, that I'm dealing with people in good faith. Uh, and yet, um, uh, because Mr. Purdy did allude to uh, some uh, uh, troubling uh, things that I found in the evidence, I thought that... Uh, that I will expand upon that, and there are a couple of other matters which I thought bear directly on uh, on the question of uh, conspiracy in his death and on the medical findings, which I think are are uh, uh, interesting and relevant to me. Um, we'll try going forward with that, and and that. Uh, how does? Oh, yeah. Um, the, the comment that Kathy Cunningham made to was a letter written by Thomas Canning to Robert Blakey, and it basically forms the, 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 my thesis here with respect to the work done by the House Select Committee on Assassinations uh, with, in the uh, medical evidence in the medical area. And that is that I, I think that uh, uh, if I were to look at the work that they did, my guess would be uh, that the work suffered by uh, uh, virtue of the fact that it, it, the work was sequestered and that there was not an integration of information, uh, that there was isolation of various parts working on the medical evidence, and I hope and expect to be able to demonstrate that here today, uh, not only with slides, but uh, in the questioning that will come afterward. But I want to draw your attention to uh, Thomas Canning's remark here. He said, I wish to convey, and this is a letter to Robert Blakey, who organized this, and who I think it is through his organization and through the way he organized the HSCA that these problems largely arose. I think that uh, had uh, Mr. Tannenbaum here continued to be involved and Blakey not had been involved, I think that things would have been rather different and the findings perhaps would have been rather different. In any case, he wrote, I wish to uh, convey my judgment of how the parts of the overall investigation which I could observe were conducted. The compartmentalization which you either fostered or permitted to develop in the technical investigations made it nearly impossible to do good work uh, in reasonable time and reasonable cost. Um, Mr. Tannenbaum, in a phone conversation, made very clear to me something which should have been obvious and is obvious when you mention it, and that is that in the doing of good uh, uh, murder investigation, as with any kind of medical investigation or scientific investigation, you want to integrate as much information as you can and spread it as widely as you can the last thing you want to do is compartmentalize and isolate different people's work working in different areas of the investigation. Uh, and it's no less true, as I said, in, in, in murder investigations as it is in science, but it appears that it's probably what happened here. And, and, and if one were to be blamed for that, it would be Robert Blakey for having organized the HSCA's medical investigation into uh, a, more like a CIA operation. Uh, the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing, and the left hand was specifically uh, uh, prevented uh, 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 or, uh, from knowing what the uh, right hand was doing. Uh, as he wrote here, he said, the most frustrating part for me was to get quantitative data uh, and even consistent descriptions from the forensics pathologist. Well, this is very discouraging. <clears throat> 
Now, the area that uh, we've touched on here is the area of the wounds, and the area that uh, Mr. Purdy t uh, mentioned was uh, the wound descriptions and some controversy pertaining to those. I'll give a little bit of background by mentioning that the HSCA faced a very difficult problem because the Parkland doctors were already on record in the Warren Commission and in other places, newspaper interviews and books and interviews by authors, as having said that there was a defect in the rear of the head. Ignoring what people like you know, Robert Groden, David Lift, and Harrison Livingston said, going right to the literature uh, of the subject, you have from the Warren Commission volumes, Kemp Clark describing a large wound beginning in the right occiput, extending into the parietal region. The occiput is the back of the head. Kemp Clark was a professor of neurosurgery. He pretty well ought to know where the occiput is. You have Robert McClellan saying the right posterior portion of the skull had been extremely blasted. Charles Carrico saying that the defect was in the posterior skull. Malcolm Perry, posterior cranium. Ronald Coy Jones, backside of the head, Paul Peters, occiput, in the right occipital parietal area. So this is the kind of problem they face because the photographs tend not to support that, as we'll see. The photographs tend to support uh, an entry wound with totally intact scalp and skull rearward and a defect on the front of the skull, as Mr. Purdy has, in fact, demonstrated, and which I'll show you here in a moment. We also have evidence that... <clears throat> Uh, that was uh, garnered by uh, someone who's here today, Tink Thompson, uh, uh, not showing his diagram um, here, but you will see this is taken uh, from Tink Thompson's Six Seconds in Dallas, and this was uh, what uh, uh, Robert McClellan drew, indicating where he remembered the a wound being. Uh, Paul Peters, who uh, wrote a letter, wrote an X with an arrow saying, that's where I saw it, too, in essence, and this is, it comes from uh, uh, Groden Livingston's book, uh, High Treason. Now, I then went back to the earliest statements made by the Parkland witnesses and organized them along where they said they saw the wounds. And here is the, here is the compilation that I have here. You'll notice here that Adolf Geisicke, or Giesicke as he pronounced it when I spoke to him on the phone, uh, I have X's all the way across because his Warren Commission testimony said that it went from the back to the front on the left side. Well, he knows he was right about right and left. He was wrong about right and left orientation. But he said it went from the back of the skull to the front of the skull, so I put all that down. Ken Salyer said somewhat the same thing. Now, I sat in a hotel room in San Francisco or in a hotel lobby with Ken Salyer side by side looking at the autopsy photographs, and he pointed to the autopsy photographs at the rear of the head and said, I'm sure they touched that up right there. There was a defect that went behind that ear, although it, did, it was on the side of the skull from behind the ear to in front of the ear. And the other person uh, was William Midget, who described the, the skull uh, defect from the temporal side back behind the ear as well. In any case, you'll see that everyone there described also a defect in the rear of the skull, and most of the people described it exclusively there, the vast majority of them. Now, this is, what, this is the comment that was published as part of the HSCA's volumes, and it said, and Andy Purdy you know, is denying to me that he wrote it. I have no reason to, to insist that he did. I don't know who wrote it. Uh, uh, but, the, the, but I think that there was clear sequestration here. The people who wrote this were not familiar with the evidence. And the medical evidence is complex evidence. I think it was inappropriate for Blakey to have chosen an attorney fresh out of law school with no real experience in medicine. You know, with all due respect to Andy Blakey, who I think is a fine fellow, but I, no specific experience in this to, to interpret this kind of evidence. I mean, this is something that should require some expertise, and it wasn't done that. In any case, critics of the Warren Commission's medical evidence findings have found on the observations recorded by the Parkland Hospital doctors. They believe it's unlikely the trained medical personnel could be so consistently in error regarding the nature of the wound. And in disagree, but however, in to, to, to dismiss this huge problem they had with the Parkland witnesses, they wrote, in disagreement with the observations of the Parkland doctors or the 26 people present at the autopsy. All of those interviewed attending the autopsy corroborated the general location of the wounds as depicted in the photographs. None had differing accounts. <clears throat> and Andy Purdy to Sylvia Chase on KRON TV demonstrated exactly where that wound was. That's Andy Purdy, and, and, and he's an amazing guy. I mean, he looks today no different than he does there. Uh, I mean, he does not age. Uh, uh, but you can see there's Andy Purdy indicating on the photographs, which we'll be seeing in a minute, uh, where he was. Uh, uh, where the wound was. <clears throat> and this is what he is saying at this point in the Sylvia Chase interview. The wound was basically in this kind of an area, which is above the forehead, and that's where it was. <clears throat> now, he was going on pretty good experimental evidence in saying that. You can see this is a diagram taken from Latimer's work. Now, I have problems with Latimer's work for the reason that I have n spoken to other people who've done research in this area, 
And one thing that needs to be commented upon about Latimer's work is that he shot skulls from behind, trying to replicate the situation of the shooting, and he reported that every skull he shot came backward toward the rifle. Now, um, apparently Alvarez did the study. Not every melon went backward toward the rifle. Some did, some didn't. Uh, Doug DeSales did the study uh, and did a, a, quite an extensive study, and most did not go back toward the uh, rifle. And in fact, I, I, I would be willing to bet, I always make these bets and no one ever takes me up on them, I'll bet $10,000 that you can't recreate 10 shootings using Manly Carcano shells on skulls where they all come back to the shooter. I'll just bet you can't do it. And when somebody tells me that you got 10 out of 10 in a study that has as many variables as shooting skulls in the manner in which they were supposed to have done it, I think that they're fudging their results. I mean, I see that sort of stuff when I, uh, when I was a TA in, in, uh, in college. In any case, that's the reason I'm not very mistrustful. But you can see that the defect is where it, quote, where it's supposed to be. It's up here in the front of the skull, more or less, you know, in the, near the, uh, in the front of the skull. The problem that we face here is that you go back to the autopsy report, and the original autopsy report says there's a large irregular defect on the scalp and skull of the right involving chiefly the parietal bone, but extending somewhat into the temporal and occipital regions. Now, if you were to take one area, if you were, I've, I've cut out this little oval here. If you were to make one defect in the skull that basically <clears throat> this 13 centimeter defect, because they indicate it's 13 centimeters, and it had to be largely parietal, but extending somewhat into the occipital and, uh, uh, and uh, temporal regions. Uh, am I inaccurate in thinking that it would be like that? I mean, is that, is that, is that what the autopsy report is saying? I mean, it, it seems that those are the words that I'm familiar with as a physician that they're saying. In any case, that's a problem. Okay, so at least the autopsy pathologists are not corroborating Andy Purdy's placement here and Nora Latimer's work about the defect being in the rear of the skull, if that's where you shoot him. But then you have uh, something, and I would like to indicate uh, my thanks to Stuart Galliner for this uh, lovely image. And here they indicate that the in-shoot was here in the Warren Commission, uh, 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 Commission Exhibit 388. And as we saw earlier today, they labeled a skull. And all of them labeled the entrance point in this region right here. Here's the external occipital protuberance with that little dot on it right there. And over to the right, and perhaps just below is one of the dots. Another one is there, and a third one is there. Here's where the HSCA determined the entrance wound was. Now, you know, we're talking about three professor pathologists. These guys taught residents. It's amazing. I mean, you'd have failed a first-year resident for making a mistake like that on a location of a back wound. And, and, and these kinds of dimensions are significant in a skull. I mean, if you had a skull, which, gosh, I just happened to have. <laughs> what a coincidence. You can see where I put these dots. I put the dots there. Now, you're talking about, you know, about the real wound being up here, but you got three dumb docs that, gosh, they made a mistake and put it down at the bottom of the skull. Now, that's a big mistake to make. It's in a different bone. It's really in a different part of the skull. It's, it, it, I have just a lot of difficulties understanding that they would have made such a mistake. The only document we have that traces right back to the night of the autopsy is the autopsy face sheet prepared by Boswell, which I depict here. This is the whole face sheet minus a little uh, uh, fragment of bone on the bottom, and this is a blow-up of this portion right here. The reason I, I, I bring this out is to point out one very important factor here, which, which was also relevant in, in HSCA testimony, volume 7, page 246 to 261, and that is that he has 17 and the word missing in here and indicates 17 missing. Well, he was asked about that for the HSCA. He said, oh, well, uh, when I examined the body, uh, there was a defect 17 centimeters long from four to aft. And at the bottom, he has these little fragments here, and that's a three, that's a six, that I think is a four, okay? Three, six, and four. That'll be relevant in a moment when I show you this. Um, did I? I want to advance that. Uh, this one does not seem to be quite as... Right there. Now, let's assume that on the night of the autopsy, Dr. Boswell knew how to use a centimeter ruler. I mean, I, th I think that's a pretty safe assumption, okay? What I thought to see, you know, I thought, you know, 17 centimeters is a very large defect in the skull. Now, it says 13 centimeters in the autopsy report. I'm going to get back to that in a minute. But 17 centimeters is what he wrote when he actually had the body in his hands and was making the measurement on the defect. Let's assume that the defect came out all the way in the front of the skull. Let's say that the defect was all the way at the front of the head, four centimeters above the superorbital ridge right there. That's as far forward as it went. Well, I put a ruler 
On this skull, and I have the ruler here, actually a different one, but it still measures the same, 17 centimeters, you measure back from the most anterior place the defect could have been, otherwise you'd have seen it blowing out of his forehead. And we're talking about right at the hairline here, you measure back 17 centimeters, and you're spot on the external occipital protuberance. If you measure six centimeters below the external occipital protuberance, you're at the lowest point of the skull, the foramen magnum. Now, I don't know whether he meant six centimeters was, you know, above the foramen magnum, but by that, if, if in fact he was, he certainly biangulated that location of the wound to the external occipital protuberance, and 17 centimeters gets its spot right on the money. If, by contrast, you take your centimeter ruler, put it at the high location, and measure forward, 17 centimeters is out here in midair. So it's a, it's a, I'm, I'm willing to admit that this is a puzzle. I don't have a good answer for this. Here we have the diagram, and here we have, this was uh, prepared for the uh, uh, Warren Commission on the left. Now, in his HSCA testimony, Boswell said something that was very important that I called him and asked him about, and in those days he was speaking to me. Um, <laughs> I asked him, I said, on the face sheet you prepared, there was a 17 centimeter defect, and as he had testified for the HSCA, I said, was that defect meant to represent the size of the wound before placing the fragment of bone that arrived late into the autopsy into the occipital wound, and the 13 centimeters meant to reflect the size of the wound after the fragment was in place? He said, right. Was there one large defect from, in the head from four to aft, or were there two? Just one defect. This is Boswell. I have, this is a tape recording. Anyone who wants a copy of the tape recording, I'd be happy to give it to Dr. Uh, 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 Wecht or, or whoever would like to have it, even Mr. Purdy. Then I asked him again. I said, does the Rydberg diagram 388 show the bone fragment back in place in the rear of the skull? Yeah. The wound of entrance was at the base of that defect and the shelving was on the inner surface of the bone and, the, and it was half on the intact portion of the skull and half on the fragment that we received from Dallas. So he's saying that that diagram there isn't the way the skull really looked when they saw the body. The skull really looked like that or some variation of that. I just took Stuart Gallinar's image and colored it in to show a much larger defect than that. So the diagram showed the bone back in place. Boswell said, yep. Yeah. He said, yep, yeah, it did. Now, that seems like a pretty crazy idea, but we have one other thing. That's Paul O'Connor prepared a diagram of what the skull looked like that he saw on the night of the autopsy. And lo and behold, there it is, a diagram that's not too terribly different than what, what Boswell is describing for us, without that last little bit of fragment back in the back of the skull around the entrance wound. This is from Robert Groden's book in a reconstruction. This is something that he discussed with uh, uh, Robert McClellan, uh, an image very similar to this, showing where he saw the defect in the rear of the skull. This is all very puzzling. Now, <clears throat> you then are faced, unfortunately, with the autopsy photograph, which shows the entire back of the scalp and skull completely intact. And then the interesting thing to me is reading uh, 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 something that was only relatively recently released by Pierre Fink. And he said, it is my professional opinion to determine the anatomic location of wounds, the viewing of the physical evidence itself, the injury seen on the dead body of President Kennedy was a better source than illustrations of the evidence. Drawings, x-ray films, and photographs are subject to distortion. I'm going to go on about the uh, question of distortion in a minute. It's uh, freezing up there again on the left. Um, you want to try to advance that left slide? I just uh, I keep pushing the same button. Yeah, I just made the battery slow or something. Um, so here we have, we have Andy Purdy pointing out the defect here, on the, where the defect was. Ronald Jones puts his hand in the same place. But Ronald Jones, in the same Caroline interview, is saying, certainly I can tell you the wound is not here. That's what he was saying. In that very end, I mean, I've got the tape here. Anybody wants to see it, they're welcome to look at it. Now, Jones was not somebody who changed his mind, like the, the, the people who the American Medical Association trotted out, who all of a sudden had a different view 30 years after the case than they had when they testified at the Warren Commission. You know, that was very embarrassing to me as a physician to see these guys, uh, uh, you know, deny what they previously said under oath. But Park, in, in interviews with three different times, he basically said, if you brought him in here today, I'd still say he was shot from the front based on what I saw. And this is Jones to, to David Lifton, Jones uh, to uh, uh, Brad Parker uh, on two different occasions. And, I think, and the po most important thing is that he says in the first one, I didn't think that there was any wound, I didn't appreciate any wound anyway in the right temporal area, the right side of the upper part of the head, you know, over the, or in front of the ears, say, or anything like that. He didn't appreciate anything there. Jenkins, who's one of these guys who was trotted out by the American Medical Association to knock Crenshaw down, said in, the, in his Warren Commission testimony that you couldn't see the defect. He was an anesthesiologist who, who huddled right around the head. He said you couldn't see the, the defect in the head from standing along the side. 
That's what he said then when he was under oath and, of course, close to the events. So we have all these witnesses. You have Charles Crenshaw down here in the bottom. You have Ron Jones, who is showing you where he's the one who's showing that it was not up here. This is where he's saying it really was, okay? Beverly Oliver said this, Phil Willis said that, uh, uh, Marilyn Williams, Ed Hoffman, Robert McClellan, Paul Peters, Ken Salyer, uh, Charles Carrico, on and on and on, all saw defect in the rear of the head. Same ones that we showed on slide right before here on slide left, but whoa, what do we have here? Now we have the Bethesda witnesses, Paul O'Connor, Jester O'Connor, Aubrey Reich, uh, Theron Ward, Floyd Reedy, Frank O'Neill. They're all saying the same thing. Amazing. Now, we have to understand something, and this is what I find absolutely fascinating. Everybody's wrong. Right? Apparently, Clint Hill, Warren Commission testimony. This is something that wasn't mentioned by the HSCA. Right? Reports on skull is missing. Roy Kellerman saying that to the left of the right ear, sir, and a little high. Yes, that uh, in portion of the skull was missing when I saw him. Will Greer, toward the rear. And what was the condition of the skull at that point, Mr. Greer? The skull was completely gone toward the rear. Phil Wheel. This is, these are new releases. These are old stuff, the HS, or, uh, Warren Commission volumes. This is new stuff that was just recently released. A slight bruise of the right temple, but I did not see any significant damage to any other part of the head. The wound was in the back of the head, so you would not see it because the president was lying face up. So now you've got... You've got uh, Ronald Jones, you've got the anesthesiologist, and you've got somebody at Bethesda saying, when the president's lying down, face up, you can't see the wound. And yet it's up here. It, it, I'm baffled by this. Chester Boyers. Chester Boyers, one person who said, he said the entrance wound is in the rear to the right of the external occipital protuberance. And extent, it, it exited along the top right side of the skull toward the rear and just above the right eyebrow. Well, I don't know what he means by that. It's, it exited up here and back here. I mean, he was one of these people who basically said it exited from all sides of the head, front to rear. I don't know. Tom Robinson. Where was this wound? Robinson. Now, he's the guy that prepared the body for funeral. He was the, he was the mortician. Uh, Robinson, directly behind the back of his head, approximately between the ears or higher up? No, I would say pretty much between them. Now, is this the same as this? I mean, one has to wonder. John Eversall, very important witness, I think. When he, he said originally to Art Smith, who's here today, oh, in fact, I think Art Smith had to go home, but he has a copy of a tape recording that he made with him. He asked him, before he went to speak to the HSCA, and this is in David Lifton's book, I thought Art Smith was somebody I had never run into, but he, happened, he was here last night and told me he's going to send me a copy of the tape. He interviewed uh, Eversol. He asked him, where was the defect in the head? He said, the back of the head was missing. Um, uh, the back of the head was missing. Uh, uh, so then he was showing the photographs to the HSCA, and he said, gosh, you know, my recollection was more of an occipital wound than this, but had you asked me this without seeing these pictures, you'd know I would have put the wound here rather than more forward. And he also said, of course, he was positioning the head to take the x-rays. He certainly wouldn't have been in a position to know where the wound was. David Lifton, Harrison Livingston, Robert Groden, and others interviewed Bethesda witnesses and all described the defect in the rear of the skull. Now, I want you to know that those last interview witnesses, all those interviews were suppressed for 50 years. And this is the thing that we've spoken about, John Newman has spoken about it, uh, Dan Alcorn and others have, that generally when we have uncovered this stuff, the, uh, the, the, the evidence has never been withheld for good national security reasons that we ever see. There, it's, it, it's withheld apparently because it confounds the, the, the previous thesis of the investigating uh, uh, organizations, be it the Warren Commission or the HSCA. Here are diagrams that were also suppressed. Here's Tom Robinson, the mortician. Where's the defect? Back of the head. Here's uh, uh, Silber, Siebert, the uh, FBI agent. Defect, back of the head. Here's O'Neill showing a defect, the back of the head, back of the head. Here is, um, uh, does anybody remember? Oh, that's Jen Jenkins, back of the head. Uh, here is uh, Kellerman. Kellerman couldn't tell right from left. The defect's on the left side. It should have been on the right. Uh, and the only person who gave drew a diagram that is perhaps compatible, if not completely compatible with the defect here, is this one by Lipsy. He made a lot of other statements. But you can see that even here, the defect extends well behind the ear. So these are the diagrams that had to be suppressed for national security reasons by the, the, the organization that was going to settle the answer about the medical questions for us. So let's go back and look at the uh, evidence according to the Parkland Hospital witnesses and compare it with what Bethesda witnesses said. And yep, most all the Beth Parkland witnesses, as I said, showed it in the rear of the head. So do the Bethesda witnesses. So now we have a very important problem. And just as, to paraphrase the HSCA, you know, you know, uh, most of the consultants at HSCA felt it was very improbable that such trained witnesses could be wrong about the location of the wound at Parkland. But so apparently were all the Bethesda witnesses. How could they also be wrong? Here's the defect in the back of the skull, and here's the skull photograph. Now, 
you've got Humes looking at this because the HSCA is telling him, no, uh, Dr. Humes, the entrance wound was right here. It wasn't down here. Humes, while he's, he is looking at this diagram, and Purdy may have been sitting there while this was happening, and, and I don't know whether Dr. Bodden was, but while he's sitting there looking at this diagram, Hume is saying, no, and that was a wound, the lower object he's referring to, and the wound on the skull precisely coincided with it. I can assure you that as Riefel reflected the scalp to get this point here, there was no defect corresponding to this, the higher wound, uh, in the skull at any point. I don't know what that is. It could uh, be, to me, clotted blood. I don't. I just don't know what it is. It certainly was not any wound of entrance. The HSCA reported that Fink strongly believed, and according to that slide I showed you earlier, that the observations of the autopsy pathologist were more important, valid than individuals who might subsequently examine photographs. Incidentally, the direct quote that I gave you earlier from Fink, stating that clearly, was also suppressed for 50 years. For no obvious reason, other than the fact it tended to confound the medical conclusions that were being misrepresented by the HSCA. Now, the most important argument, I think, that the x-rays and, auto and photographs are complete and authentic is the statement you'll find in uh, post-mortem, and it is a statement signed by Humes, Boswell, Stringer, and Ebersol uh, on 11-10-1966. And they write, the x-rays and photographs described and listed above include all the x-rays and photographs taken, taken by us during the autopsy. We have no reason to believe that any other photographs and x-rays were made during the autopsy. Now, think about it a minute. You go on a vacation trip. It's a very, it's like your honeymoon trip, okay? Real important to you. And you take, oh, 60 pictures. You don't open it up for, for three years, and then you're given a raft of pictures, and you're saying, and you're, and you're, you're asked, were these all the pictures you took? Is there anyone in this room who can honestly tell me, yes, these are absolutely all the pictures we took? No, you're not gonna remember after three years whether, you, whether, whether that's a complete inventory of pictures. But the interesting thing is, did these guys write this? They didn't. The Justice Department wrote this thing and had them sign it. And in fact, they're on record as having said that the autopsy uh, photographic record's incomplete. They're on a record all over the place, and I'll get to that. But you can see here, on the afternoon of November 10th, 1966, I took the original and one carbon of this document, Report on Inspection of Naval Medical Staff at the National Archives, and I took it to the Naval Medical Center, Bethesda, where it was read and signed by Humes, Boswell, Eversall, and Stringer. Certain incorrections were made. They prepared this of justice, said, okay, boys, sign this, and they're good patriots. They signed it. Stringer. He remembers taking at least two exposures to the body cavity. There's no exposure to the body cavity. Humes. Specifically recall, photographs were taken of the president's chest. Those don't exist. I've been to the National Archives and seen the originals myself. They're not there. Boswell. Thought they photographed the thoracic cavity and lung. Carni, he recalls them putting a probe and taking pictures and the body was laying on its side. Now, these are all doctors. I guess all doctors with faulty memories, except that they can remember three years ago that the photographs that they took is complete and photographs they haven't seen in three years. Floyd Reeby, I thought we took about six pictures. I think it was three film packs of internal, internal portions of the body. Andy Purdy interviewed Stringer and said it was his recollection that all the photographs that he had taken were not present in 1966 when he saw the photographs. He noted that the receipt had some uh, of the film holders had no film in one side of the cassettes. Now, you got to understand, this guy's a professional photographer. If anybody's used a view camera, you know how film cassettes work. It's impossible to load in an empty film cassette and take uh, photographs. And they're saying, oh, yes, uh, some of these came back empty with no film in them. Well, uh, it's, it, it, it's not something that can happen. Charles Petty and Fink had a long conversation. I'm not going to go into it in the, in the interest of time here. But Fink was told, was he's looking at the back of the photograph, he told them in, an, in, an inter, in a, a memo to Blumberg in 1966 that he had photographed the skull, the internal aspect, internal external aspects of the skull wound to document it. And he's being shown this and asked, is that the, the one that you took? And they're showing him the back of the skull with the scalp intact. And he says, no, 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 that skull, that scalp, not skull. You're showing me soft tissue, not the skull wound that I took. He specifically denied that the skull wounds were the ones that he took so that you could forensically prove the entrance, which would have been a very important thing to prove photographically anyhow. So I, I'm going to end where I started, and that is by saying, and I would like to ask uh, Dr. Bodden, I showed some, uh, some images here of diagrams that these people prepared. Did you ever see those before? Those diagrams prepared by uh, the, the Bethesda witnesses showing defects in the rear of the skull and so on? Did you ever see those images? We looked at all of the uh, autopsy photos. No, and I'm not talking about the ones that were prepared by the witnesses at Bethesda. Well, then, no. You never saw those. Now, this is the kind of sequestration and, you know, the kind of compartmentalization we're talking about. 
Those are important forensic pieces of evidence. The Bethesda witnesses are describing what they saw. Who should have seen them? Weck never saw them. He told me that last night. Biden's sitting here today. He's telling you he never saw them. Why not? In any case, the final conclusion is one that Canning also came up with. I did not anticipate that the study of the photographic record itself would reveal the major discrepancies in the Warren Commission findings, but such has turned out to be the case. Thank you very much. Does anyone have an oxygen tank for Gary? Wow, I have to tell you, I've been to a lot of these conferences and I don't think I've ever seen anybody say as much substantive discussion in as little time and keep to it and go right on. So Gary, thank you again. That was outstanding. Um, pro pro proving why he didn't need an introduction. Uh, I was going to read the, the thing from the blurb and say, besides that, he's a, he's a nice guy and his, I love his car because I got to talk to it a lot this summer. Um, speaker needs no introductions except for please welcome Dr. Cyril Weck. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a uh, deadline and whatever it is now that's been left to me, uh, I certainly will abide by it. <clears throat> I'm pleased to have given the time to uh, some of my colleagues. As a matter of fact, I remember a, uh, a debate once with William Buckley on television and it came time for him to have rebuttal. And he sat back, folded his hands across his abdomen and said, you know, I think I'll just take the time to sit here and reflect upon what I said earlier. I'd like to take, I think, I think, I'd just like to sit back for the next 15 minutes, whatever I have left, and reflect upon what uh, uh, Wallace and David and uh, Gary and David Mantic and, uh, and Roger uh, Feynman have uh, presented. It's, it's been outstanding. Let me try uh, in the minutes that I have left to me to cover uh, some points. And if I get some of the slides, uh, fine. There's so much. Um, Dr. Weinberg said he's looking for a quest for a consensus. I want to point out to you that every national poll that has been taken going back more than 25 years in the United States of America and those that have been taken abroad, we've had a consensus. He also uh, talks about, uh, makes a big thing about fees and honoraria and saw to it that in the uh, GM article, which was published, they rejected it. They told me to take it down to 500 words. There have been other letters to the editor, Dr. Lundberg, that have been in excess of 500 words. I was told if I had one word over 500, it would not be published. At the end of my article was put down that I had received a stipend for my work as a technical advisor on JFK. I get $3,500 for going away for one day and staying overnight. I'll tell you this, I got one hell of a lot less than that for the work that I did uh, on the movie. Uh, what has money got to do with it? I hope that Dr. Latimer has made and will make a million dollars on his books. I hope that Dr. West makes a lot of money on his video. They're entitled to it. I, what, what's, what's the problem? Uh, well, what's the problem? So the fact, though, that it's put in for me that I made a, uh, a stipend. He said Dr. Humes was not a fully trained forensic pathologist. Come on, Dr. Lundberg. He wasn't a trained forensic pathologist from day one. He never spent one single day in a forensic pathology training program. Dr. Lundberg, a pathologist, knows that. Dr. Lundberg was an academic pathologist before he became editor of GMA. Look at the HSCA testimony when Humes had to look into the eyes of the forensic pathologist and knew that he could not bullshit them and see what he said. He had not done medical legal autopsies. Let's not obfuscate that issue. Russell Fisher, trust him with your life. Well, I trained in Baltimore. I won't get into that whether I trust him my life. But I'll, let's, let's look at something that is tangible. Fisher and others go in the Ramsey Clark panel, which we came to learn about years later. They knew for five years before I disclosed it to Fred Graham in the New York Times in August of 72 that the brain was missing, the microscopic autopsy tissue slides, the paraffin blocks, codicombs of the internal chest wounds were missing. These men who testified in court in murder cases all the time never said a word, never said a word about the missing evidence. You talk about integrity? tell you what Russell Fisher would have said to attorney Brown who came to him and said hey I want you to testify in a murder case that has to do with gunshot wounds in the head we don't have the brain doc and that's not a right we don't have the vicious lines Russell would have said goodbye goodbye yeah he had integrity in this case somehow it seemed to have left him 
Dr. Clayberg made references to various pathologists about how they all agree, and Dr. Petty, the top forensic pathologist in the world, well, I won't get into a urinating contest, especially in the presence of a specialist in urology, Dr. Latimer, as to who is, who is the top forensic pathologist in the world. There are a couple or a few dozen forensic pathologists in America who would d disagree with that. And insofar as what do pathologists around the world say, I'm not conducting a survey, but let me tell you, man, I have lectured on this subject by invitation in Australia, South Africa, London, China, Israel, and a dozen other countries, and dozens others not by invitation, but as part of a program. I know what they feel. They feel that the Warren Commission report is the biggest bunch of nonsense that's ever been perpetrated in the field of forensic science. That's what they feel all around the world. <laughs> Dr. Lundberg said they did an interview, they did interviews with all the pathologists and all the doctors at Parkland, he mentioned, and they were published, I think his exact words, in 21 pages of journalism. Tell me, Dr. Lundberg, when your man, Dennis Brio, went to Dallas, did he interview Dr. Charles Crenshaw? What kind of journalism was that? When you stated in your publication that Dr. Crenshaw had not been present at Parkland Hospital that day, that there had not been a call, heavens no, there was no call from somebody who said he was LBJ. Charles Crenshaw was ridiculed, held out for obloquy in the eyes and minds of 350, 400,000 physicians in America. That man was defamed. It's a matter of record that he was there at Parkland Hospital. And it's a matter of sworn testimony by at least two people that a call came in from somebody who said he was LBJ. But Dr. Crenshaw was not interviewed for JAMA, although Mr. Brio was in Dallas. I guess Fort Worth was too far away. <laughs> Dr. Lundberg stated the point of entrance on the back of the head. It makes no difference. Did I hear that? Yeah. 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 On the Larry King show last year, he also said to me when it came up that the single bullet theory was something he had not addressed. Already in the... May 27th edition, he had laid it out, he had a big press conference in advance of the journal reaching people, something that I don't know if has ever been done before, but he hadn't even addressed a single bullet theory. Now he tells us that it makes no difference. I leave it to you. Here, yellow is parietal, blue is occipital. Does it make a difference? Are you standing up there? Are you shooting from there? Are you shooting from a whatever? Does it make a difference? doesn't make any difference. My God, thank God that Dr. Lundberg is now with JAMA because I would hate to see him testify in a murder case and have his rear end torn apart by F. Lee Bailey on cross-examination if you ever made a statement like that in a case involving death due to gunshot wound to the head. makes no difference. Uh, one of the reasons it makes no difference is about six of the doctors down there at the time testified they saw cerebellum. My friends, here, cerebrum, cerebellum. They look different. They look very different. To say that people, including a neurosurgeon, did not know what the hell he was talking about when he said cerebellum, to tell me as a pathologist that I can't tell the difference between the uterus and the liver? <laughs> This is the way they casually dismiss it. Whatever is needed for a given moment in time, it's like 399, whatever its final point of resting needs to be. The night of the autopsy from Kennedy's back, the next day from Kennedy's neck, five months later under the cockamamie single motor theory from Connie's left thigh. Whatever you need, man, whatever you need. Down, high, low, up. Humes, Boswell, think. What did they tell us? Got a hole at the back of the head, right? EOP, to the right of the midline, slightly above EOP. Right. Clark Panel tells us later, four inches higher. Here, here's down here, and here's up here. Dr. Lundberg says it doesn't make a difference. Dr. Lundberg publishes in JAMA that these guys have now given indisputable proof. They had the EOP wound then, they capitulated and bowed under the heavy pressure, the hammering they received from my forensic pathology panelists and the HSCA deliberations. And they said, well, okay, if you guys say it's up there, it's up there. 
Now they publish in May 27 and October 7, BRB, Dr. Lundberg, it got back down to the LP. Which is it, Dr. Lundberg? Ask your colleague, Jooms and Boswell. I don't know. You're right. I wasn't there. Tell me. But you sure as hell are not going to walk away from here with two entrance wounds in the back of the head. Before you leave here, tell me which one you opt for. Your buddies, Jooms and Boswell, the men you would trust with your life down at the EOP? Or are the experts up above four inches higher? Which is it? It can't be both. <laughs> publication, publication of materials. I'll tell you, I counted 40 pages, 40 pages. Three and a half are, from, are, are given to letters to the editor of a con nature. Five back on October 7th, and then mine in March 24th, 31st edition. I should be very, very complimented. Dr. Lundberg put it to rest on October 7th. He said that was the final word. JAMA had addressed it. My 500 word, my stinking little 500 word letter in this latest edition opened the door to three new articles by Dr. Artwell, Dr. Latimer, and Dr. Petty. Tell me, Dr. Lundberg, when were those three articles solicited? Before or after? How come you can't give any space to Aguilar and Mantic and people with credentials like that? Wait, 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 Dr. Latimer. Dr. Latimer referred to John Nichols in his visit. I, I, to borrow the phrase, and believe it or not, Dr. Latimer, I was going to use it, and all I got to say, <clears throat> I, I would tribute you, you know, the, the, the great line from Lloyd Benson, I knew, I knew John Nichols, and I sure as hell knew John Nichols. John Nichols repeated the experiment from Edgewood Army Arsenal, shooting the bullets into cotton wadding, shooting the bullets through goat carcasses, to break one fracture to simulate Cormley's rib fracture, shooting through human cadavers to simulate the radial fracture. John Nichols got the same results that Edgewood Army Arsenal got. Those bullets are all substantially deformed and fragmented. And that experiment will not be repeated. I begged, I implored, I offered to pay myself as a member of the HSCA panel. Repeat the experiment. They will not repeat it. The only one who does these experiments somewhere in the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere, with his family, is Dr. Latimer! He does experiments everywhere! Everywhere he does experiments! It's fantastic! What the hell do they need anybody for? Olivier, started in any of these people, Edgewood Army Arsenal, Dr. Latimer was their man! It is absolutely incredible. Shooting fish in a barrel, he says. I'm waiting to find out then how come he misses the car completely. What a schmuck. I mean, it is right there. The car right in front of him is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Shoot, man, shoot. And miss the car. The next two, I better get in. By God, they'll take away my scores from the U.S. Marines retroactively. Dr. Artwell, uh, Dr. Uh, West, they talked about the transverse process being hit and fractured, and the spinal cord is deflected, and if it's deflected, that means that the bullet must be deflected. To where, where does this come from? Not from the panel. You know, I disagreed with these guys, but they were eight sharp, experienced forensic pathologists. Dr. Artwell stands here and says that he, I think his exact words, that he is bothered or disturbed or angry, he gets upset every time he sees Dr. Bodden's disruption. I know, Dr. Bodden, you are not Dr. Bodden. When Michael Bodden has forgotten about forensic pathology, you won't know for the rest of your life. You're upset about what he presents. He's my dear friend. I should be upset about what he presents. But we can disagree on the conclusions. At least Michael had the, the, the integrity, and the others did, to rip Humes and Boswell apart for this horrible, horrible autopsy. And Dr. Lundberg, who does know, who is a competent pathologist, who knows very well in his mind and his heart, who has written on this, who has editorialized, who has talked about the need and the importance of autopsies, he knows what a crummy job it was. And yet he says, in one of the slides, and I guess I don't have time, he says that these people did 
a fine autopsy. It was all that was necessary for this autopsy, despite the fact that it was on an extraordinary man under extraordinary circumstances. I want to tell you something. If they did autopsies like that in any approved medical legal office in the United States of America, their certification would be lifted so fast by the American Board of Pathology, their heads would spin. And you know who would be the first to agree with them? Dr. Lundberg. But this case is different, right? This case is different. Dr. West, I, I know Richard Thornburg. Worked with him when he was in Pittsburgh. Personal friend, U.S. attorney. Richard Thornburg has enough problems. Don't give him that refund. Please, please. <laughs> um, well, I, 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 I give the honorable to uh, Doug Carlson's uh, guest and, and heed my time. There are a lot of slides. There's so much to say. On the uh, thigh wound, oh, well, Dr. Latimer, this is, this is priceless. Dr. Latimer talks about it. I don't like to talk about how they were skeptics. All the skeptics going in. <clears throat> I know that's true with Dr. Artwell because I've seen some of the things uh, that have been given to me what he had said in Prodigy, and he has a right to change his mind. So I know it's true that he started off uh, feeling good for me. He was, he was one of us. <clears throat> but here, here's from Dr. Latimer. He says that... Uh, he didn't know how he felt going in, right? March 13, 1970, Medical World News. He didn't get into the archives yet. March 13, 1970, Medical World News. Ready for this quote? Quote from Latimer. Oswald showed what the educated, modern-day, traitorous gorilla can do among his own people, working with religious-type conviction, willing to lay down his own life, but proposing to kill as many anti-communists as possible. Oswald was devious, skilled at his business, and amazingly cool. That certainly are the words, those are the words of a skeptic, right? <laughs> of a man who has not yet arrived at any opinion. And then we've got these bullets, bullets that are tumbling, and they're tumbling, and they're tumbling. We got a hole in the neck that they measured. One doctor there said five millimeters, another one said seven to eight millimeters. They got it tumbling through the neck. And yet they talk about in the next breath the keyhole configuration of a tumbling bullet. What kind of a keyhole was that? Whose house? The dollhouse. Where? What are you talking about? Then they talk about keeps tumbling and tumbling. And they talk about Dr. Petty being the top friends of the Dr. Petty still talks about a bullet going around the rib. It's doing circles like a merry go It doesn't go through Conley's chest. Forget that the lung was punctured. Forget the 10 centimeters of the rib were blown out. He's got the bullet going around. And then somehow there's, hey, I've had enough inside the chest on the outer already. So somehow it just blows out and it comes out the chest. That's Dr. Penny's. Uh, and then on and on it tumbles. And here we have from Dr. George Shires, professor of surgery, chairman department of uh, surgery of Southwestern Medical School, who took care of Conley's thigh wound. There was a one centimeter punctate missile wound over the juncture of the middle and lower thirds, medial aspect of the left thigh. X-rays of the thigh and leg reveal the bullet fragment which was embedded in the body of the femur and the distal third. Now that's from the surgeon. It's casually dismissed today. I think it was Dr. West. You know, the, oh, the fragment is not down there. The fragment is there, whether it's embedded, as they said, or right in juxtaposition to it. And this business, he says, well, it only went in an inch and a half and fell out. You know, I, I am not, you've never heard me talk disdainfully. I can't because too many of my close friends and critics are not MDs and they've done an absolutely incredible job. So you don't have to be an MD, you don't have to be friends with the to talk about this, but know something if you're going to get into these things. A bullet that goes in an inch and a half that has an overlying hole of an aperture of four, five, six, centimeters, uh, millimeters, one centimeter. What is this business about bullets plopping out? I've never seen it in 12,000 autopsies and 25,000 other autopsies that I've reviewed. Where the hell does this come from? That a bullet goes down and then all of a sudden it gets pushed out again. 
This is a continuation of the Hume's Boswell fake nonsense from the night of the autopsy. That external cardiac massage to the left side of the president's chest forced the bullet that had gone into his back out through the same hole when they learned about the bullet having been found on the stretcher and reported at Parkland Hospital by Tomlinson to the FBI. And the next day, when they learned about the bullet hole in the neck, that hole then represented the bullet wound and exit. The bullet moving 2,000 feet per second, coming up, hitting his starch collar and stopping dead in his tracks. And now it was from the front of his clothing. And then five months later, it was from Conley's left eye. And as Dr. West tells us, we're in an inch and a half. I know we've got the inch and a half measurement. I've never seen that. But I'll take an inch and a half, Dr. West. Good enough. Tell me how it comes back out through a one centimeter hole. I have never seen it. And the shearing effect, oh, what an amazing coincidence. 6.5 millimeters in diameter, circular piece of metal, which Humes and Boswell, these men of known repute and integrity and competence, and Eversol never saw right there at the colic. At the colic, they never saw it. And it magically appears some years later. Isn't that priceless? My friends, we've lost two bright, intelligent people to the other side. Dr. Artwell and Dr. McCosey, but we've gained thousands. You continue to talk, you continue to present the facts, and we will be marching by the tens of thousands, and we shall learn the truth in the years ahead, in our lifetimes, I guarantee it. I think I know how ba Bill and Gail Newman felt when they wanted to instinctively duck from what was going around them because I don't want to be up here right now. <laughs> <laughs>